Lawrence is a director at Vitalab. He's a gynecologist and subspecialist in reproductive medicine. And Lawrence is already doing hysteroscopy for the last 35 years and is maybe or probably the most experienced hysteroscopic surgeon in our county. So it's a great privilege for me now to introduce Lawrence to all of you. Hey, thank you very much, Lehman, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation from uh, Cornet and uh, from Metronic and Hilton. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be associated uh, with such a professional group of people and uh, having been introduced to the uh, hysteroscopic resection uh, tissue removal system, not resection, but a mechanical tissue removal system. So. It gives me great pleasure to start, and uh, as uh, Suleiman mentioned, he said uh, consent is obviously very important, and uh, it's certainly a two-way discussion between us, the doctor, and the patient. And in order to, uh, you know, impart informed consent, we need to know what are the complications, because that's really what the patient's interested in. And uh, we, we start off with primary complications, which happen at the time of the procedure, and then we end up with secondary complications, which come about a little later. So there was a lot of mention about no touch technique, and uh, as Jack mentioned, COVID now actually sort of forces us to rather use a no touch technique. So, you know, volcellums and tenaculums can cause cervical laceration. We can perforate the uterus, and once we get into the abdominal cavity, we can cause quite significant visceral uh, or abdominal injuries. Uh, hemorrhage, distension, media-related complications, which I'll spend a bit more time on, which I think is the most important one. Air or gas embolism, which we'll mention, which I must say in my 35 years I've never seen, but uh, in medicine I always say never say never, um, because as when you think you've never seen it, that's when it comes your way. From a secondary complication point of view, infection, hematometra, and adhesion formation. And the patient also needs to know that there is a potential for you to maybe need to perform a laparoscopy if there is a perforation, or even a lap laparotomy, and I think even a hysterectomy. And uh, one problem is the, the minute we tell the patient that we're going to do a hysterectomy, I think they, they want to run away from... Uh, from, from doing the procedure. So I'd like to know how many uh, of us guys actually tell the patient she may end up with a hysterectomy. Fortunately, again, it's not something that we, we commonly need to do. If we look at the complications, the most important thing is that 50% of them occur at the time of hysteroscopic entry. And it's the elusive cervix. We think the cervix is a round, perfect canal. It's not. It's sometimes to the left. It's sometimes to the right. You often have uh, a posterior ridge. And that posterior ridge is what we end up forcing our Hagar dilator through. And then we get in with our hysteroscope and all we see is what looks like a complete Asherman's because we're now in the myometrium and we see all these uh, criss crisscross of myometrial fibers and we think this is intrauterine scar tissue formation of a severe nature and we pull our scope out and we make the wrong diagnosis. The other thing that plays a major role in, in post-operative complications is obviously the surgeon's experience and, as Suleiman mentioned, the type of procedure, you know, and if we're going to start going for a very large fibroid, we're going to end up in trouble. Cervical dilatation was addressed, and uh, I, I, we don't really dilate the cervix, but you will see in textbooks about hysteroscopy, you can use the old laminaria tent, uh, an osmotic dilator, you can use misoprostol, and uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the studies don't really say that it makes that much of a dif difference, but the least traumatic and the best way to do it is obviously, as Jack said, vaginoscopy. He did show you the vaginoscopy procedure. I'm just going to briefly go through, and yeah, you put your scope in, touch the posterior fornix, bring it forward, you'll see the posterior lip of the, uh, cervic the cervix, You'll then actually see mucus and uh, the uh, arbor vita and the vessels, and you just let the fluid follow in and your scope then moves on with it. Um, 
in this situation, you'll see bubbles going through there, and that has been, I can't remember who the name of the man is who described this, but he sometimes uses the means to see are the fallopian tubes open or not if you see these little bubbles going through. And these are the bubbles that one should have purged beforehand, and they're also bubbles that are caused by numerous insertions of your scope which it then creates a venturi effect and takes the gas bubbles in or the air from outside, which can then lead to air embolism later on. So as Jack pointed out, much better to, to, to not keep moving in and out with your scope, to get in there once and do what you need to do. One important thing is make sure you warm the distension media because um, it cools the patient down quite quickly. And the solutions that we use today are mainly isotonic. Um, in the past, we used to use hypertonic solutions. The problem with hypertonic solutions is if they intravasate, you get a much quicker hyponatremia and you need to manage the patients with um, high molecular weight sodium. Um, and uh, there are various ways of doing it. You can either do it like the old system where we would elevate um, a one liter or a 30 liter bag. And some of us would even put a, a cuff around that and pump that cuff up and uh, it's quite dangerous. It really is. And if you're not a competent, quick hysteroscopic surgeon, this kind of uh, process is, is really, it can be very deleterious to the patient. And uh, the most important way of using fluid in the uterus, and uh, as, as, as Suleiman said, uh, don't be scared of doing a hysteroscopy, but just to note that when you do a laparoscopy, you're in a much bigger arena. But when you do a hysteroscopy, you, you sort of put off by the fact that you are in a, a much smaller environment and, and things are very, very different. So important to limit human error, to try and limit the rate of intravasation and also to allow us an early warning of an excess deficit. Use a fluid monitoring or fluid management system. If you are using uh, a mechanical uh, monitoring, and that is you need a dedicated person to be with you, you cannot do the procedure and worry about how much fluid has gone into the patient. And in fact, your entire operative team should be continuously aware of this fluid deficit. And yeah, you also got to be careful because sometimes there's more fluid on the floor and you need a boat to, to row yourself out of the theater than there is in the patient. And if you look at the system with my cursor here, you put your three liter bags on the back and this is actually a weight. And the fluid monitoring system where the fluid gets sucked out into is also a weight and it's subtracted. And up here is a little monitor that'll tell you exactly what the fluid deficit is. And you can also set it with a warning system. So you in real time know, provided you're also taking care of what's um, on the floor. But whatever's on the floor will not go into the system. So you could have a bigger loss than what's actually there. So just be aware, it's not a foolproof system, but it does allow you continuous flow and aspiration so you can clear out the blood as you're working and you have clear visuals all the time provided. And one of the problems if you're using the mechanical tissue removal system is one tends to pull the scope back and you must realize that the scope is your means to get the fluid and get the right pressure in the cavity. And some guys bail on the, on the metronic and mechanical tissue removal system because they can't see anything and they don't realize that they've just got to push their scope in a little further in and then suddenly you get this beautiful distension and you can see what you're doing. And importantly, there are no chips that you need to remove. Now, fluid overload is the most dangerous thing. And unfortunately, in our country, some young women have died from the procedure um, because you get into a lot of trouble if one is not aware and not uh, watching what's going on. Uh, incidence of fluid overload in competent hands is no more than about 0.1 to 0.2%. So one will say, ah, but Lawrence, that's very low. I think one must not be blasé and one must be very aware and certainly when we're using a normal saline, we will set our limit. And the minute we get to two and a half liters, we will get out of that uterus. We will not allow our egos to take over and try our best to finish the procedure at the cost of a life of a patient. If you're using your uh, glycine or mannitol or those things, you can get a hyponatremia much quicker. And we set the limit at 1,000, but I must say, I think most of us, the majority today, use Ringer's lactate. Some people use normal saline. Uh, we mainly use normal saline. And as I say, please warm the solution.
Now, interestingly, if you've got a five micron meter venous vessel in that uterus, you can put half a liter a minute into the patient's intravascular volume. And the other thing that aggravates intravasation is if you put the patient in Trendelenburg. So we need to look at how do we prevent distension media complications. On the one hand, you can consider preoperative use of GNRH agonists to shrink that uterus a little bit and give you an endometrium that is more inactive. It does not stop you from then penetrating the endometrium, getting into the myometrium, gonad uh, gonadotrophin releasing and uh, agonists, or it's not going to help you, nor is the pill going to help you, because the minute you get into that myometrium, you open up the vessels. Intraoperatively, strict fluid deficit monitoring. Stay out of trouble. Don't try and get out of trouble. Do not exceed the recognized fluid deficit thresholds that we've mentioned. Maintain your intrauterine pressure as low as possible to allow adequate visualization. And it's probably slightly below the mean arterial pressure. Sometimes you have to increase that, but just be aware of it. Avoid tissue traumas, making too many holes in the myometrium. Be careful of false passage formation. That's another form of allowing you to intravasate. And a very high, a, a higher amount of vigilance is very important if you start to prolong in the procedure. And I always say to the students, 15 minute rule. If you're still fapping in that unit, just above the mean arterial pressure, you've cut into the myometrium and you are now taking more than 15 minutes, be aware you're going to get into trouble. A uterine cavity that's large is also sometimes very difficult to distend and it can give you visuals that you don't know where you are and sometimes it's not an easy procedure and obviously if you have penetrated the myometrium uh, in, in, in a certain amount of depth and I always say our anesthetists need to be part of the procedure. They are our best friends. They look at, and we don't quite understand why, and I'm happy for anyone to give me the answer, but one of the earliest signs of fluid intravasation and overload is parotid swelling. And uh, if you look at the parotid here, it's very easy to see. The other is uh, subconjunctival edema. You just ask the anesthetist to flip the lower lid down, and you can see the edema, and you know the Lasix needs to be brought out. And by right, you should then look at stopping the surgery, getting a UNE to check for hyponatremia, manage accordingly, and obviously Lasix intravenously. The other thing for the anesthetist to be aware of is if the diastolic BP starts to go up by 15 millimeters of mercury or more, or if there's increased pulmonary pressure and he's having problems uh, getting some uh, oxygen into the patient, you must know that you're running into trouble. So your anesthetic team is also part of who limits the amount of intravenous fluids because they mustn't just open the drip and let it run in because that's another source of you overloading the patient by means of your anesthetist not being aware. So intravasation, a big problem. It's dependent on the duration of the operation. Obviously, the total volume of fluid that you use, what intrauterine pressure you're using, and the extent to which vascular channels are invaded. Uterine perforation is another important one. And as you'll see, and I'll just move this up a bit um, so we can get to it, but you can see the practitioner's already made a hole, and now he's going to fiddle, and he's going to make the hole even bigger. And then he's going to fiddle even more because he's still lucky because he's got distension and he hasn't had loss of, distension, loss of visualization because there's still adhesions or something making sure that that's still a seal. So don't go in there with your resectoscope and start fiddling and burning because you certainly may have small bowels stuck there. Uh, you may have transverse colon stuck there. So be very careful. So excessive bleeding and difficulty in accessing the cavity suspect a uterine perforation, false passage, important, loss of distension and you can't visualize, if there's a rapid increase of a fluid deficit, and if you see this areola or tissue, you see how the physician is, or the, the clinician is opening it up even more. So you confirm the uterine per per perforation usually by visualizing the contents of the peritoneal cavity, noticing adipose tissue, bowel, etc. So if we look at how do we manage uterine perforation at the time of hysteroscopy, so if it's entry-related blunt perforation, you can abort the procedure, you can observe the patient in the ward for intraabdominal bleeding and peritonism, and consider the use of a broad-spectrum antibiotic and provide strict discharge precautions to the patient. 
And I think we have inadvertently perforated uteruses at the time of DNC and we haven't noted that and the patient's gone home and hasn't turned a hair. Versus if we have sharp mechanical or electrosurgically related perforation, we should then perform a laparoscopy to inspect the perforation site, have a look at the abdominal contents and make sure we haven't injured that. Suture the perforation if there's persistent bleeding. And if need be, you may end up considering a laparotomy if you feel that is clinically warranted. And again, this is a problem which uh, some of us have uh, been in before, where you leave it, should have left it alone, you irritate the clot and now it bleeds. And uh, yes, in this case, there was reason to perform the laparoscopy, put your suture in and then get out. But often if you had left that clot, and I think as I say, it happens at the time of DNC, um, the patient doesn't really bleed because she has her own clotting mechanism that stops it. So if we talk about trying to avoid hemorrhage at the time of the procedure, try and do it in the early follicular phase. You can give the patient combined oral contraceptives in the cycle before or GnRH analogs, which may be advantageous. If there is hemorrhage, stop the procedure. If you need to resuscitate, do so appropriately. Often by manual uterine compression works very well. Otherwise, if the patient is still bleeding, call for the pediatric Foley catheter I, outside the patient, blow up the catheter. I then cut off the tip because often when you put the catheter into the uterus, the tip uh, gets in the way. So I cut it off just above the balloon. I inflate it with 5 to 10 mils of saline and keep the patient in for a few hours. In the few cases that I've used it in, I often send the patients home and I bring them back the next day and I then remove the catheter and uh, they're absolutely fine. Um, obviously, if the bleeding continues despite this, you need to think of other reasons for why the patient's bleeding or perhaps there's unrecognized major trauma of the uterus. And the other thing which you may want to pull out is intravenous cyclocapron. The air gas embolism, uh, to try and prevent it, make sure your fluid in the line is purged of any air, continuous outflow of fluid during entry and adequate uterine flushing of bubbles is important. Beware of the Trendelenburg position, beware of the piston-like action of repetitive hysteroscopic entry and excessive uterine pressure, and be vigilant during prolonged procedures if you involve electrosurgery because you make bubbles from the electrosurgery which we can intravasate into the uh, vascular system. So stop your procedure immediately, remove your scope, place the patient in the left lateral position, perform appropriate recess, and in the rare event of acute distress, respiratory distress syndrome, and maybe pulmonary edema intensive care may be required. Infection, post-operative endometritis from your hysteroscope is very rare. There seems to be no difference between patients who receive antibiotics and those given placebo in the randomized trial. Um, as Suleiman said, if anyone wants these literature, uh, this literature, feel free to email us. The American Congress of ONG does not recommend routine use of prophylactic antibiotics when we are doing hysteroscopic procedures. And post-operative endometritis can present with pain, vaginal discharge, fever, uterine tenderness, and obviously an elevated white cell count. The antibiotic prophylaxis, as I mentioned, it's not recommended, but you will see certain papers where uh, various different drugs are used. And one, if one does have, uh, if you've diagnosed the endometritis, begin for 48 hours with IV parenteral treatment and then go on to oral treatment for 10 to 14 days. And there are various different regimes, which I'm sure you know. Um, Post-operative adhesions, um, yes, um, we the most common reason causing from uterine surgery, and I always say the uterus is the center of the universe, it's for preservation of the species on this planet, and when it's not pregnant, you can drive in a front-end loader and you don't get problems. But if it's pregnant and you're operating it, beware, you're going to get Ashermans. And the other time we get Ashermans is when we do opposing fibroids. Opposing fibroids, if you take one out that's anterior and one out that's posterior, you know that when you do your second look at a hysteroscopy, you're going to have Ashermans. So rather do those as an interval procedure and do two procedures for opposing. The next thing is, um, should we be giving the patient um, uh, estrogen afterwards to support um, the endometrium and to grow the endometrium? The way I explain to patients is to grow the good grass over the raw patch. Um, there are various literature supporting 10 days of estrogen. In fact, Mark Emanuel has said that if you do it in the follicular phase early of a patient who's ovulating, she's got enough estrogen to heal that uterus and he doesn't give the patient 
estrogen. We use it as routine. We give them, we call it an ENP regime and our post-op nursing sister hands it to the patient. It also controls the next cycle. Do I put a loop in? Well, there is no evidence to recommend that any kind of uh, support in that uterus, be it a catheter balloon or anything like that, is going to give you a, an efficient response to your uh, surgery for Asherman's. So there's no evidence of efficacy for IUDs. And yes, we do do second book hysteroscopies and adhesiolysis if the surgical procedure was a very difficult one. I think one gets to a level where you sort of understand that all you need is a quick office procedure a month later rather than to, to do anything in theater. And if there are any adhesions, you can get rid of it. Hematometra, we know, yes, we can end up with a blood collection in the cavity. And it's very easy to diagnose with uh, ultrasound. And we do treat it hysteroscopy, uh, hysteroscopically. And what's very important, and I always preach, that always have an ultrasound in your theater when you're doing hysteroscopy. Do not do hysteroscopy without an ultrasound. It's so easy. Fill the bladder, clamp it with, a uh, with, a, with an instrument, and get the abdominal transducer. And you can see exactly what you are doing. And again, not to be brave, one can go to slightly bigger fibroids and deeper fibroids if you have your ultrasonographer in the theater with you and you don't need to worry about a, uh, a safety zone where we used to talk of having at least a, a centimeter safety zone between the end of the fibroid and the serosa. So today, if you do it combined, and again, I say I'm not being gung-ho and I'm not being brave here, I'm doing it under very controlled conditions. And you can also use your trans, uh, vaginal transducer transrectally, and you can get a picture posterior if you're dealing with posterior pathology. Almost getting to the end, obviously, lying on the table, this is where a lot of medical legal stuff comes from where we do things wrong and we don't position the patients correctly. If we look at top right here, don't do this. Don't try and narrow this angle here between the legs of the patient and the abdomen. Always make sure that you've got at least an angle here more than 60 degrees. These are the older poles. Fortunately, some of us are, have a luxury of the newer poles. Uh, some of us aren't and we do still have these old poles and beware that the peroneal nerve is right there against the pole and all the nerves that we could damage is obviously if we have a much reduced angle of less than 60%, we're going to stretch the sciatic nerve. If we compress here on the fibula, we're going to get the common peroneal nerve. And we also have the obturator that could be a problem. We have the lateral femoral cutaneous of the thigh. And we also have the femoral nerve that we can stretch and cause a paresis afterwards. So advice to gynecologists starting out in the world of MIS is training, train, train, train. Get a mentor, get a proctor, train. Attend courses that are geared for your level of experience. And yes, we talk of take to work messages. Start with easy cases. Go to polyps, go to fibroids. Figo zero and one, as Suleiman uh, detailed it for us so nicely. Refer your type two fibroids rather if you're not comfortable for them with them because you're going to have a longer operative time, you're going to have an increased fluid absorption, an increased risk of perioperative complications, and you will not always completely restrict, uh, resect the lesion. And I always say never allow our egos to get in the way because that is when we run into trouble. We forget about the patient, the anaesthetist is none the wiser, and the next thing, the anaesthetist's eyes are popping out his skull or her skull because the patient's now in uh, acute respiratory distress. So it's a very safe procedure. Uh, Suleiman said it's a very easy procedure, and I 100% agree with him, and I think it's something we should not shy away. I think this is the gynecologist's stethoscope when it comes to pathology of the uterus. There's a low rate of complications, it's less than a percentage, and when an untoward, unexpected adversity happens, the skill of the physician is manifested by the prompt recognition and appropriate management of the complication. Thank you.